Labour spent the general election lying through their teeth to you, and they were directly facilitated by most of the British media. And yeah, the Tories were also lying through their teeth, but they were always rightly going to get their asses kicked, as happened, and lose. So their lies were an abstraction rather than about what was actually going to happen. Now, notice how you're suddenly hearing a lot about Labour saying, bad news, everyone. Things are much worse than you think. There's a £28 billion black hole or shortfall in the nation's finances. So this week, the front page, for example, of The Guardian was Chancellor to reveal £20 billion shortfall in public finances. The front page of the Sunday Times today, £20 billion black hole covered up by the Tories. So is this what's actually happened. Have poor old Labour marched into the corridors of power, rifled through the filing cabinets and the top secret under padlock spreadsheets and gone, oh my word, things are so much worse than we thought. Guys, have you seen this? Hey, Billy Buzz here. Where the hell did this come from? In the words of Phoebe from Friends. That is brand new information. <laughs> For those who listen to me during the general election, don't worry, I won't be offended if you had better things to do. I said two things consistently. One, that there would be a Labour landslide, so you could vote Green or Independent without risk. And two, baked into the nation's finances, based admittedly on arbitrary fiscal rules, we'll talk about that, there was a £20 billion a year shortfall. Now, I said this because it was clear Labour did not want to talk about this £20 billion. Why, you might ask? Good excuse to bat the Tories, point to how they'd left the country in a mess. Well, because Labour ruled out borrowing so they then either had to set out which taxes were going to rise and they ruled out a whole series of tax rises on the rich or they'd have to say which services that they were going to cut. So firstly, here I was on Sky News on the 9th of June, 25 days before the general election. For me, it's about the looming black hole in the nation's finances, which neither political party is being honest about. Uh, Labour are going to win a massive landslide. Spoiler, that's how this story ends, by the way. Um, but if, as the Institute for Fiscal Studies put it, both main parties, and I quote, are avoiding the reality that they effectively signed up to sharp spending cuts while arguing over smaller changes to taxes and spending. Um, the chief economist at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation says, according to plans from both parties, you either get a further £20 billion a year in cuts to public services by 2029. That's George Osborne cuts, by the way, uh, on top of the cuts that are already baked in. So it's not like George Osborne. This comes on top of the previous austerity. Yeah. Labour, rather than talking about £2,000 fictitious, you know, hikes in taxes on working families, they need to hike taxes on the well-off. They need to hike taxes on the top 5%. They rule that out, and that means austerity. The media needs to focus on that because that is coming down the track and there's not the discussion we need on it. You hear that? Yeah, £20 billion a year. There it is, the exact number. Now, I repeatedly spoke about it on this channel. So here, for example, I talked about it with The Economist, James Meadway, on the 6th of June. That was exactly four weeks before the election. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, um, they have said both main parties are avoiding the reality that they are effectively signed up to sharp spending cuts while arguing over smaller changes to taxes and spending. Now, Alfie Sterling as well, who is the uh, chief economist at the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, previously at the New Economics Foundation, he says the real tax dishonesty is the silence over what happens if they don't rise. Answer, according to plans from both parties, either a f further £20 billion a year in cuts to public services by 2029, that is close to the George Osborne cuts of mm -hmm. the 2010 to 2015 era, or around £20 billion increase in borrowing, which is around £60 billion higher by 2029, which Labour have ruled out doing. Here's what I talked about on the 25th of June on The Jeremy Vine Show. According to the Institute for Fiscal Studies, who you just quoted, there is at the moment an annual £20 billion worth black hole. A black hole in our finance is worth £20 billion a year. If you don't fill that £20 billion a year, that means, ta that means you have to cut public services by £20 billion a year. That's on top of all the cuts that we've already had for the last 14 years. So if you wanted to just stand still and look at the state of our services now, just look at them. If you want to stand still, you've got to find £20 billion a year extra mm. to fill that hole. How have we got through, and this isn't just about our politicians. I'm sorry, this is, and I've been working in the British media now for 13 years. How the hell have we got through weeks of a general election campaign without the main focus on domestic policy about a 20 billion pound a year black hole and how we fill it. 
Where has the questions been? Instead, we had for a while Rishi Sunak, I'm afraid, making up nonsense about increasing uh, ta that Labour was going to have this tax bombshell. The question should be, we should raise taxes, not on most people. Most people can't afford extra taxes at the moment, but the well-to-do are doing very well. They can. Okay. And unless we do that, this country is going to fall apart. On social media on the 13th of June, I said Labour is promising that there would be no return to austerity. That means no real terms cuts to any public services adjusted for demand on those services. That means finding at least £20 billion extra a year just to stand still. That is public services devastated by years of cuts. On the 24th of June, I said if we had a functioning media, the main domestic focus of the election would be there's a £20 billion annual black hole of the nation's finances. Either you raise taxes and say which taxes and who pays for them or you cut services already battered by cuts. On the 25th of June, I responded to one of the examples of Starmer being challenged over this on Sky News. Let's just listen to that first. But do his sums really add up? A leading think tank accused the two main parties of hiding the need for tax rises or spending cuts after the election. The Labour leader says he can defy the experts. Yes, uh, we need to invest in our public services. I ran one for five years. I believe in that. Yes, we need to grow our economy. I don't actually agree with these forecasts that are premised on the basis that we cannot grow the economy, that things cannot be better than they are now. They can be. That's the change on offer. When I say he was being challenged there, well, not exactly Jamie Paxman, that was it. Starmer was presented with a vague question and allowed to dismiss it. So I wrote in response, there was a £20 billion a year black hole in the nation's finances. You need to fill that just to stand still, i.e. to be in a current woeful state. That's without even discussing the ageing population or how reducing immigration means less revenue. This is not an answer. Now, it was not only me going on about this. Let's just be clear, far from it. Uh, let's listen to the brilliant Ash Sarkar on the BBC's Politics Live on the 18th of June. The election was on the 4th of July. And when it comes to the Labour manifesto, there's a lot that you're not saying. What you're not saying is what you're going to do about the planned £10 billion to £20 billion pounds worth of cuts, which were already announced in the March budget. Will they be going ahead? Will they not be going ahead? Your tax and spend plans are tiny. Now, what I think you guys are going to do, you don't want any headlines which say Labour are going to raise tax. What you're waiting to do is maybe pull some rabbits out of a hat, maybe do some reforms to capital gains. Maybe you're going to fiddle around with the Bank of England rules because lots of your plans, for example, around uh, retaining staff in the school system or retaining staff in the NHS, that's going to cost you money. And you know that and I know that. What the manifesto's job is, is to get you over the line for the election. It's not actually a plan for government. You might say it's smart politics, but it's fundamentally dishonest with the country. Notice there how Labour's Darren Jones, the Chief Secretary now to the Treasury, was shaking his head. Why is that then, Darren? Was she wrong or was she in fact right in what she said? Now, were me and Ashaka psychic? Did we have the powers of Nostradamus? Are we in fact economic geniuses? Well, I hope Ash isn't too offended when I say, no, we're not. The books were open. We knew all of this was true because the Office for Budget Responsibility set out the state of the finances months before the election. Let's listen here to Paul Johnson, economist and head of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, one month before the election. We will be very rude if the new government comes in and says, oh, look, this is a terrible shock. We've opened the books. The OBR have told us something we never expected. And that's why we didn't tell you about all these tax rises we're going to introduce. Or that's why we didn't tell you we're going to have an entirely different set of fiscal rules. Or that's why we didn't tell you about the spending cuts. I think that would be fundamentally dishonest of them. What I would put to you all is this. The election went on forever. Well, I mean, it certainly felt like it, didn't it? It went on for 43 days, just over six weeks. There was, I'd put it to you, ample time to question Labour about minor things like, I don't know, domestic policy. The likes of me and Ash are treated within the British media basically like silly little kids, even though I'm very much a geriatric millennial. But those silly, naive lefties hi, who don't know what's what, unlike our big grown-up journalist colleagues who've got the inside tracks. That's the gist, isn't it? So where were they? What were they talking about during that election? It was obvious to us. Why were they hammering Labour about this based on the OBR predictions? We had far more questions during that election put to politicians, I don't know, about the existence of trans people than we did about, I know, a minor triviality like national expenditure, the future of our public services. Who is taxed and by how much? But what chance for the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves is now going to do, is one big performance. We have just discovered this black hole, I'm afraid, guys. 
Woo! Now, firstly, no one thinks she's just going to respond to this with a load of straightforward austerity. She's likely to do something on capital gains tax, which is unearned income. It's the tax you pay when you sell or gift an asset. It should be taxed at the same rate as income tax. It's absurd it isn't. Now, if she increases capital gains tax, that's welcome. There's some other progressive tax rises that is tax targeted at the well-off. That will be welcome. The problem is we're talking about £20 billion a year here. And she ruled out a load of tax rises before the election, like increasing income tax for the better off, which gives her very little room for manoeuvre. Now, I just point out, there is ample money, ample money in this country in order to be able to invest in the country and its services. Now, for example, the Sunday Times Rich List, every year they go through the richest individuals and households. And according to their last Rich List, um, the combined sum of the 350 richest individuals and families put together is 795 billion pounds a year. Bear in mind, total government expenditure in this country is 1.2 trillion pounds a year. So, you know, the fact is these people together, the amount of money they have is bigger than the entire Polish economy. 350 individuals and families. There is enough money in this country. You just have to tax them, the richest people, a bit more. But Rachel Reeves also adopted completely arbitrary fiscal rules from the Tories, like the current budget must move into balance and debt must be falling as a share of the economy by the fifth year of the forecast. Now, this is completely unnecessary. Closes down borrowing in order to invest. The other point is the £20 billion a year sum is just going to keep us at the current level that we're at, notwithstanding. I'm not even talking about an ageing population there, which is putting more and more pressure on each year. And also the government's determination to bring down immigration which, and this is completely missing from the debate, is a net contributor to the nation's finances. You have less immigration, you've got less money coming into the country. Because if you talk about the net cost, if you like, of having people using public services, migrants tend to be younger, so they're less likely to use the health service, for example. Um, if you, so if you take that, take that sum and then the amount they contribute, through working, tax it, being taxed, all the rest of it, they're a net contributor. So you have less immigration. That's one of the costs. It's a financial cost. Look, our current situation in this country is completely catastrophic. Have you seen the state of the country? We need a lot more money to invest and rebuild the country, some of which is quite literally falling apart. Well, we should have an honest conversation about this. And we should have had the honest conversation before the general election on the 4th of July. We had a general election campaign, which is supposed to be about scrutinizing politicians and what they're gonna do when they're in office. But we were denied that honest conversation. So now we have headlines like, in this Friday's Financial Times, Reeves to delay infrastructure projects to address fiscal hole. That is completely and utterly insane, economically speaking. We were told that we cannot invest because our economy is struggling, so we can't afford investment. But then, you ask, why is our economy struggling? And do you know why it is? Because we're not investing enough. So as well as the fact we cannot afford not to invest in infrastructure, this traps us in economic doom loop. We've got to invest in order to grow. Well, we should have debated all this, but we didn't. Why? Why didn't we debate this when it actually mattered? Well, the argument I made in the election is in large part because of our media. Many political journalists see their job as being based on access on getting politicians to talk to them and feed them information in advance so they can get, get what they call a scoop. They get gossip. They're more in the know than their colleagues, so they're a better place to win prestigious press awards. Well, the problem is politicians know all this and they use it to their advantage. The basic deal is, okay, cool, I'll give you access, but don't piss me off too much because if you do, then I won't give you access and that'll screw you over. Now, journalists knew that Labour was going to win and they knew Labour was going to win by a big margin. And they did not want to piss off Labour politicians who were going to be in government for a very long time and who have long memories. And they knew that putting Labour on the spot about which taxes they were going to hike or which services they were going to cut during a general election was going to piss off those Labour politicians. And that's why you ended up with the likes of yours truly, Hello, and Asaka, who can give a toss about whether these people speak to us or not. Talking about something incessantly, which I've proven to you, you can't look at the evidence I provide and go, well, he's bullshitting here. I clearly told you over and over again what was going to happen. And our colleagues who see themselves as the real journalists are like us. I'm sure they just call us bloggers or whatever. They didn't talk about it. They didn't do their job. One of the most, the most important domestic policy issue of the election. And the thing is, this whole episode proves 
how our media works. You can see, you see that these journalists now either have two options in response. They're not going to respond. They're going to go, la, 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 ignore him, as they often do. They will either say that, if they were honest, they'd either have to say that me and Ashaka are economic geniuses and prophets. As I've said, that is unfortunately not true. If they think that, make us editor of a newspaper. You know, we'll do your job instead. Or they admit that they refuse to talk about it because they thought it would undermine access. And this is client journalism. That's what we're talking about here, client journalism. Those are their two options. There's no other options. And it tells us a lot about our democracy. It tells us about how democracy works. It is surreal watching something you said would happen over and over again and fall before your eyes. It's a little bit on the gaslighty side, I have to say. It's like you say something over and over again, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and then it just can't happen. It literally happens. But I did say it would happen, and it is happening just as I said it would. Don't be fooled by these people. They're liars. And their lies are being aided and abetted by journalists whose job is supposed to be telling you the truth. We can see that. And you can see they're not doing their jobs. And that should ask big questions about our democracy, about our media, and about why you are not being told the truth about the country in which you live. We deserve better, a lot better. Please like and subscribe. Do leave your comments, do leave your thoughts. Do you help us, I suppose, with the, in this case, as you can see, the journalism, which that lot failed to do at patreon.com forward slash ownjoes84. We've got lots of very big things to come. I can assure you, very excited about it. You'll see what I mean uh, soon. Um, listen to podcasts. We're going to go and update those now. <laughs> Speak to you soon.